Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. It's the first time I'm doing this, so it's very exciting. Um, we have a terrific panel today. I'm going to try to um, make the introductions as short as possible. But um, I did, know, did not know Deborah Mati before today, and I just got her information. And I, I edited it down, Deborah, but I, there was too many, some things I just couldn't keep out. They're too important. Okay, so can our topic today is uh, obstacles, barriers, and solutions in feminist religious hermeneutics. For those of you who don't know, I'm Ruth Rodeg from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, semi-retired. Um, okay, Professor Emerita. Uh, Deborah Majid is our first speaker. She's from Belwat College. She's a religious historian who makes the interconnection between religion, gender, and justice central to her life's work. She is the first African-American female and first Muslim to be tenured in the 174 year history of the college. Her groundbreaking book, was published in 2015. It's called Polygony, What It Means When African-American Muslim Women Share Their Husbands. She was an activist for social justice at the college and in the wider community and continues to work for healthy Muslim marriage in mosque communities. Um, most recently, she developed um, uh, a grassroots initiative called Queen City Family Associates. All right, assalamu alaikum, peace of God be upon you, wherever you are, everyone can hear me well? Yeah. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Let me also share greetings from Imam Abdella and Tepi and other MLIers or members of the Muslim Leadership Institute based in the United States. My title to privilege state or religious law, a look at the four hijabs. By the time readers of the works of the late Fatima Marnisi encounter her first, her third English language book, The Veil in the Male Elite, A Feminist Interpretation of Women's Rights in Islam, they have entered into a counter narrative world where Muslim women can and often do, in the words of Kamala Harris, newly elected vice president of the United States, eat no for breakfast. Even after the death, in, even after her death in 2015, Marnisi's preoccupation with the gendered manipulation of sacred texts and the coexistence of dueling legal systems continues to revitalize efforts to embolden interpretations of the Quran that extend to women levels of responsibility and accountability that are traditionally reserved for men. If a 12 minute animated film produced a year after her death is any indication, Marnisi's nuanced gender conscious approaches along with the activist agenda of other reform scholars are weaponizing a new generation of activists eager to project the Quran as an egalitarian tool that authorizes itself to expose injustices of patriarchal portrayals of Islam. This presentation briefly examines Exa examines the utility of the four hijabs, a short animated effort that promotes readings that challenge the hijabophobia of the West, as well as tendencies among some Muslims to insert their interpretations into the mouth of God. De depending upon one's definition, nothing is said about hijab in the Quran. Narrowly defined though, hijab, sometimes also called veil, pertains to the physical attire of Muslim women and or pieces of fabric they use to cover their hair and or any other parts of their body. More broadly, hijab also refers to a cluster of ideas, debates, and practices about Muslim dress for both women and men, connotes the separation of physical space, encompasses a set of behaviors, and symbolizes a level of alertness that reminds Muslims that their thoughts words and actions are known by Allah. Women who adopt hijab do so by choice, by imposition, and for a variety of other reasons. Whether hijab or veil, the term holds a prominent place in our understanding of the relationship between religion and politics, patriarchy and women's freedom, and the beingness 
of good Muslims. It is the overarching object objective of the four hijabs to liberate Muslims and others from Quranic illiteracy, along with its epistemological and political ramifications that situate this project as a fitting partner in discussions about feminist religious hermeneutics. At the heart of the film is the regulation and control of Quranic interpretation for which divine roots and mandates are claimed. In particular, how 12 specific verses given by God to the prophet Muhammad are read, understood, and embedded in everyday life. The film acknowledges the presence and historical privileging of conventional readings of these verses and the power they exert to link patriarchy and Islamic ideas. The film further stipulates the role, role or responsibility of women as understood in the verses and their resulting application are erroneously accepted by many Muslims as being consistent with divine directives. For the purpose of this presentation, such normalized accounts serve as religious law. Equally important to the four hijabs is the pronouncement that conventional readings or religious law are but one of two systems of normative beliefs and practices that coexist among Muslims, even as a second system, even as the second form is demonized by the former, but promoted by a new generation of reformists. State law, as some scholars argue, really helps to enforce religious standards. So it may come as no surprise that my use of state law here refers to a grassroots social ordering of anti-patriarchal exegetical practices that invites both religious and secular actors to rescue the Quran from religious accounts in order to recover principles of male-female equality that have been distorted by religious law. In this way, state law creates secular public space for others to question whether justice can exist in religious law if women do not experience it, a theme that dominates this scholarship of Muslim feminists like Ziba Mir Husseini, Amina McLeod, and Amina Wadu. By drawing upon the four categories of the film that perform double duty as its primary characters, spatial, visual, ethical, and spiritual, I will argue that the film raises a plausible dichotomy of religious versus state law and its attempt to encourage alternative interpretations that celebrate self-understanding and threaten to raise the hijab that covers the mediocrity and servility that is presented to us as tradition. Most recently, Mernice's The Veil proved to be significant to the development of Pedagogies of Deveiling, Muslim Girls and the Hijab Discourse, a five-year exploration in two southwestern U.S. border towns. The research of author Manal Amza served as the inspiration for the four hijabs released in 2016. Originally developed in an English language version, the four hijabs has since been dubbed into Arabic in Amman, Jordan and Damascus, Syria. By mid-January of this, of this year, the English language version on YouTube had garnered roughly 6,000 views. The film opens with three individuals walking along what appears to be a deserted path. The cloud-filled sky is drawn in a bright green, suggesting a beach setting on a sunny day. The cool undertones of the gray pathway are dark enough not to compete with the sky and bright enough to remain in the background, allowing viewers to notice the character's complexion and hair color, as well as their attire. The youngest of the three, a girl, carries what appears to be a soccer ball and announces, I want to learn the story of the hijab, the real story. A brief discussion among the trio ensues, first establishing various meanings of the term hijab, including to cover or protect as a boundary or barrier. This approach indicates the word can function grammatically as both a noun and a verb and leads the youngest character to announce one of the film's uh, key messages. So it's not just a headscarf. The dialogue continues. The headscarf is but one small part of it. The hijab is not only about modesty and piety. It's actually more complicated than that. I know it's about separating men and women. No, the whole gender separation thing is a big myth. But every conversation about hijab is to veil or not to veil. 
<laughs> which is the wrong question, especially for this story. Exactly. The real question is about four distinct hijabs that appear in 16 Quranic verses. Just 16 verses? Yep, just 16 out of thousands. Wait, one, two, I know maybe four, the popular ones. I know at least six. Yes, and those popular verses have been misread. The other 10 have been completely silenced. Can we read them ourselves? I mean, without Quranic scholars? Of course. We need to be our own scholars without mediators. We can interpret the text for ourselves. Let's revisit what the Quran says about the four hijabs. Freeing our imagination and engaging our minds and asking questions about building a gender just world. We can do that. We can do that and more. Enter the four hijabs. Configured as geographic shapes that with mouth-like openings, yet serving as the, with mouth-like openings, yet void of association to physical form, each hijab appears under its own spotlight. First and serving as the convener of this portion of the film is the ethical hijab, a green configured triangle with a square opening for its mouth. In its welcome, ethical hijab announces, we have suffered and we have been wrongly accused of making others suffer. We have been misrepresented, distorted, contradicted, taken out of context, and we have been co-opted by patriarchal politics. So we are here to reclaim our Quranic verses, clarify our layered meanings, and speak for ourselves. Next up is the spatial hijab, the divider between private and public spaces, and formed as two pieces of crimson blue fabric whose meaning resembles a wishbone. Following spatial is the visual hijab, the modest dress prescribed for both women and men drawn as an eyeball with long black lashes covered in red fabric. Ethical returns to introduce itself as the gateway to piety and modesty. Last of the four is the spiritual hijab, the barrier blocking spiritual and intellectual advancement. Shown in flowing yellow material that can as easily take the shape of a curtain or a blanket as it can a partially eaten pear, spiritual declares, I must be overcome. Following a bit of banter between the hijabs, each proceeds to announce its contribution to the collection of hijab verses, 16 passages from 12 chapters of the Quran. Three of the hijabs, visual, spatial, and ethical, are mentioned twice in the Quran. Spiritual assumes 10 references. Leading off this segment, Spatial announces that it's mentioned in chapter 33, verse 53, and Surah 19, Ayah 17, reflect its meaning as a curtain or room divider, in the former to separate the prophet's private chamber from his visitors, and the latter as protection for Mariam as she prepared to give birth. Visuals two mentions occur in chapter 24, verse 31, uh, Surah 33, verse 59, where forms of the Arabic terms kimar and jalaba are being translated as head cover and loose outer garment. Both references address believing women after believing men were similarly commanded to be on guard and at a time when violence against women was prevalent in the unsafe streets of Medina. The second verse also adds a specific directive to the wives of the prophet. Still, Visual serves as a universal and diverse symbol of modesty through dress that is adopted by Hindus, Jews, and members of other world religions. Reference in two verses from the same surah, uh, chapter 33, ethical reflects commands given first to the prophet's family and later directed to all Muslims to be inspiring models of piety. Spiritual concludes with the introduction of its 10 Quranic verses noting that in each it is translated as a veil or a barrier that inhibits deep spiritual growth and new knowledge, sometimes at the direction of human beings, other times at the command of God. Even with its um, plethora of citations, this hijab moans, I still feel erased. No one has ever heard of me. I am the one who inhibits consciousness. I impair vision. I deafen ears, I numb minds, I prevent Muslims from overcoming ignorance and illiteracy. With critical inquiry and deeper knowledge, Muslims can transcend me. 
After a second round of banter, the hijabs complete their presentation by refuting some of the ways they are misread. Among them, visual hijab. I've been turned into a fixed symbol of female Muslimness. I don't exist to restrain women's bodies. Spatial hijab. I would never prevent women from participating fully in public life. I don't imprison women in their homes. That's creepy. Ethical hijab. I am not here to police Muslim women or men in public or private spaces. The individual Muslim determines how to express modest behavior, not me. Spiritual hijab. How, do I be, how did I become the suppressor of knowledge, free art and critical thinking? I am not the enforcer of ignorance or backwardness. I'm the obstacle that Muslims must overcome using free will. New knowledge and spiritual depth await Muslims who see beyond me. So there's not one right interpretation? The young girl interrupts. There can never be ethical response. You have to interpret our verses and understand them for yourselves. That's something that anyone and everyone can do. And shifting attention to self-understanding and the freedom to reclaim personal authority, the film does would do well to do more vis to more visibly caution against the promotion of haphazard, oversimplified interpretations just because someone proclaims them. That said, and changing in changing the terms of knowledge production and encouraging readings that understand the hermeneutics of meaning. The film supplants views of the interiority of women's relationship to hijab as limited to physical space prescribed to control them with exploring hijab as a mindset and a way of being that is intended to govern the adab or system etiquette of all Muslims. With a look at the four hijabs, we are to witness, we are witness to a privileging of state law over religious law. The film provides solutions in terms of created opportunities for scriptural reinterpretation, whereby a new generation of performers can eat no for breakfast too, every chance they get. Wow, <laughs> thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Manti. I, I was thinking you had the Jewish, whether the Jewish head coverings are gonna speak as well. Um, <laughs> oh, one, la one thing, uh, what's the name of the film so we can find it on YouTube? Yes, it's The Four Hijabs. Four Hijab? Yes. Okay. Ah, four, F-O-U-R Hijabs. Yeah, and oh, if you I'll want to, I, I'll put a link to it in the chat. Oh, okay, excellent okay. idea. Meanwhile, we're moving on to Dr. Lisa Antabi Yamimini. Uh, she's an anthropologist, a researcher at CNRS, the French National Center for Scientific Research, and a mentor, member of EDEMIC, Institute, the Institute for Mediterranean, European, and Comparative Ethnology at uh, Aix Marseille University. She specializes in migration studies and in studies on gender and religion specifically regarding women in Judaism and, and Islam. She published an edited volume in French, Dream et Musulman, Genre et Religion en Negociation in 2014, I've just ordered it, <laughs> and a study of Ethiopian Jews, uh, also in French, de Gondar à terre promise, les Juifs et, et Ethiopiens in 2018. Her topic is Negotiating Gender and Religion, Exegesis, Space of Worship, and Religious Functions Among Jewish and Muslim Women. Uh, uh, Dr. <laughs> I'm calling everybody by their formal names, although I have a tendency to want to call you Deborah and Lisa because that's a weakness of women. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi, very nice to meet you all. And thank you so much for the organizers to organize such an interesting conference. And I am very honored to be here with um, a lot of um, researchers here who have written extensively on the issues I'm going to talk about. Um, so for centuries, women have been segregated in the space of synagogues and mosques and excluded from rabbinic and Quranic study, as well as from rituals and religious leadership. Since the middle of the 20th century, Jewish and Muslim feminisms 
have led to a critical rereading of the sacred texts, Torah, Talmud, Quran, Hadith, and to claims for gender equality in religious space and clerical responsibilities. Today, women who master exegesis and interpret Jewish law, alakha, or Muslim law, fiqh, access new religious public functions, such as women imams, orthodox female rabbis, Jewish and Muslim female spiritual guides, ma'arat, or murshidat, experts and counselors in Islamic and Jewish law, alimat, or yoetzot alakha, Jewish legal advocates, toanot rabbaniot, and female judges, Kadia in Sharia courts. I will attempt in this paper to look at the two religions and show converging and diverging strategies to curtail male monopoly while remaining inside Orthodox Judaism and mainstream Islam. Now, a lot of researchers have been focusing on these topics uh, separately in each religion, and very few scholars have actually uh, looked at them together. And here, I'm sorry, Jan Feldman, I think is not in the participants, but she wrote a pioneering book in 2011, which I think was one of the first attempts to actually compare um, both the religions. And of course, the numerous works of um, Professor Rodet, who is here, uh -huh. um, are also one of the examples of um, this uh, exception where um, researchers um, have been looking together. I'm going to skip my first part on uh, Jewish and Muslim religious feminisms, trying to compare them um, from lack of time. Just one sentence to say that I will concentrate here on Jewish Orthodox feminism, uh, since in non-Orthodox Judaism, uh, one can assert that women have uh, reached uh, more or less equality in religious functions. Um, and concerning Muslim feminism, um, just also one sentence to say it's much more politicized, much more tied to post-colonialism, of course, than um, um, Jewish feminism. And yet claims are very similar, asking often for gender equality and particularly changes in female and uh, family law. And I think yesterday we also saw um, with the different lectures how there is a move from scholarship to social activism, uh, especially in uh, Islamic feminism. So I'm coming to my second part, which will sketch very, very quickly uh, common channel challenges and claims of religious Jewish um, women and Muslim uh, women. First, uh, claim access to sacred text, study and interpretation. Second, reclaiming spaces of worship and ritual and increased ritual participation. And three, creating or aspiring to create female public religious roles. Um, access to sacred texts began in the 1970s with Orthodox women uh, studying Torah, Talmud, and uh, the commentaries, what was dubbed Torah, a women's Torah learning revolution. In a somewhat parallel move, Muslim women in the 1980s began reading the canonical texts of their tradition with a critical lens, especially in Iran. At the same time, an increasing number of Quranic madrasas and institutes of higher religious Islamic learning open to women throughout the Muslim world. And in 1976, the first Jewish Orthodox Institute of Advanced Learning um, for Torah and Talmud for women opened in Israel. Uh, afterwards, a number of midrashot opened, and you can echo with midrasa, uh, were created in the United States and Israel. Today, a female elite of wise Jewish and Muslim women contribute to the emergent field of feminist Islamic and Jewish exegesis, or tasfir and midrash. They attempt to deconstruct the patriarchal interpretations of the Torah and the Quran and offer alternative readings which have been obstructed by centuries of male interpretation, often blurring the distinction between normative Islamic Jewish law and, and uh, Islamic law and local practices, Muslim or Jewish. This conferred upon women who had reached a um, high level of knowledge, the authority to engage in a counter exegesis or to use the words of Amina Wadu to launch a gender jihad. In addition, we have to contend today with the emergence of LGBTQI Muslims and Jews and take into account a growing queer exegesis of the Quranic, Biblical, Talmudic and Sharia corpuses 
adding new non-heterosexual readings to the texts. Second claim, reclaiming spaces of worship and increased ritual participation. More and more women are asked to be granted a new place in spaces of worship, uh, synagogues or mosques, where they were traditionally either completely excluded or segregated in remote areas. Uh, for example, Orthodox women are asking for more egalitarian spatial transformations. Uh, I can't elaborate from lack of time. Um, in um, in um, countries like the UK, there have been campaigns, um, one called Open My Mosque, for more friend women-friendly mosques. And in France, for example, I just want to give um, one example of a mainstream uh, mosque in Bordeaux, where um, after a two-year debate, women were finally placed in the same prayer hall as the men, but separated on one side, yet without a physical barrier. Two burning issues today um, uh, lead to heated debate. In Orthodox Judaism, the claim of certain women to read publicly the Torah in a mixed audience, which is still opposed by the Orthodox establishment. And in Islam, uh, the question of uh, mixed prayer and of women leading prayer for, women, for men and women and of women delivering the Friday sermon or chutzpah. Uh, the third claim, creating new female public religious roles. Both in Judaism and Islam, one witnesses in the last three decades, new public functions performed by women in the field of religious counseling, preaching and spiritual guidance, and religious law. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Yuatzot al the advisors in Jewish law that um, began in 1997 in Israel guiding and answering uh, questions on uh, female ritual pur purity. In 2006, Morocco appointed for the first time female preachers and religious guides, murshidat, who work closely with the imam in various mosques. This is a pioneering function to preach and advise women in a government effort to foster a modern, tolerant and egalitarian Islam or state-sponsored Islamic feminism. However, there are two other controversial roles, uh, which I want to talk to about. Um, several Muslim women in North America, Asia, and Europe have lately self-appointed themselves imamas, leading Friday prayers for a mixed assembly, delivering Friday sermons, and performing the call for prayer. They celebrate Muslim marriages, perform divorces, funeral ceremonies, and um, other um, rituals. In France, very interestingly, in 2019, three women uh, declared themselves imam. The first, Franco-Algerian Kahina Baloul, rec recited a mortuary prayer in a Parisian cemetery, and a few months later, led the first mixed Friday prayer and gave uh, her first sermon uh, for a mixed congregation. Two French converts, Anne-Sophie Monsigné and Eva Janadin, also led a first time mixed Friday prayer, also in Paris. For more than a decade, institutes in Israel and the United States have been training Orthodox women as spiritual leaders and halachic authorities. Yeshivat Marat, founded in 2009 in New York, has ordained over 40 women with the title of Marat, female guide in Jewish law, spirituality, and Torah. And today in Israel, Various programs offer Orthodox women curriculums equivalent to those of men in rabbinic studies. And maybe here in the discussion, we can also talk about um, the um, question of uh, taking the exams for the Israeli rabbin rabbinate. Um, a handful of pioneering Orthodox rabbis have also since 1990 uh, ordained in private over a dozen women as female Orthodox rabbis. Again, this is not recognized by any orthodox establishment. In the field of religious law, female Torah scholars have been asking to participate in the interpretation of Jewish law and even act as female decisors or poskot, but are still not recognized by any orthodox authorities, even though uh, they have published on halachic questions and answers and have um, discussed uh, different ways to uh, proclaim um, rabbinic opinions. Um, as opposed to this, women experts in Islamic law, alimat, um, are being granted more and more legitimacy. In Morocco, they uh, sit on uh, regional ulema councils 
and even on the Fatwa Council. And in Al-Azhar University in Cairo, three women issue fatwas intended for women. There's also a professionalization of new legal roles, for example, rabbinic advocates, Toa Not Rabbaniot, trained in Israel since 1993. In Islam, women have been appointed female judges, Qadia, in Sharia courts since the 1980s, and more recently in Israel in 2017, and Ronit and Tanya have um, written recently on this. Now I want to uh, come to my last part which is looking at the strategies of negotiation with male monopoly in these two uh, religions. One strategy I want to look at is separation from men. Second is partnership with men. And the third is what I would call breaking from within. Uh, other researchers have also um, uh, found different expressions for this. In a way, the most uh, conservative approach which allows women to tiptoe cautiously their way into the male religious world without um, um, making any conflict. So the first strategy, separation and creating all female spaces. For example, in study, we see today more and more Bate Midrash, study halls for Orthodox women, where they study together, in particularly the daily Talmud page, the uh, Daf Yomi. Muslim women also have been setting up alakas, where they learn, read, and discuss sacred texts together. Um, and there have been also successful initiatives, such as um, women creating all women Sharia courts, for example, in India, with decisions that are even binding for civil law. And I think that's a fascinating topic. Uh, female prayer groups also sprung up, for example, in Orthodox Judaism, women's minyanim, women's prayer quorums, where they sometimes read the Torah among themselves. Of course, Orthodox decisors are still condemning this. And just to give one example, in France, there has been only one and only attempt by a uh, Talmudist scholar, Lilian Vanna, who for the past eight years is holding um, Torah readings by Orthodox women uh, in community centers because no Orthodox synagogue will allow this. Um, the rise of all female mosques is also very interesting. Um, they date back, for example, to the 19th century in China. But today we see in Muslim majority countries more and more all female house houses of prayers. And in North America and Europe, women setting up uh, all female mosques. For example, female Imam Sherin Kankan is the founder of the women led Maria Mosque uh, in Copenhagen that opened in 2016. And it holds all female Friday prayers with five rotating women serving as imamas, giving the Friday sermon, the khutbah, reciting prayers and calling for prayers or being muezina. Um, these women reproduce the gender segregation inherent in these, um, either in Orthodox Judaism or conservative Islam by excluding men and sometimes challenging male religious authorities who perceive their practices as a provocation. Yet some women claim that by bypassing religious male authority, it's the only way for them to practice and reclaim their faith. Second strategy, partnership with men, a radical way of rethinking gender equality. This approach is based on the idea that, the true, that to truly bring about change in the religious status of women, it is necessary to collaborate and enter in dialogue with men willing to support their struggles. One sees, for example, various initiatives in study, um, more and more co-ed religious learning, especially in the Muslim world is going on. Again, from Morocco, the example of the Murshidat the religious guides who train with imams, for example, at the Mohammed VI Institute for Imams in Rabat, and learn together. Uh, we haven't seen this yet in any Orthodox Institute. Um, but in Israel, for example, men and women study informally at the Bet Hillel Forum of Orthodox rabbis, and even have a group who together are talking about alachic ways to proclaim collective rabbinic decisions or responsa together. Of course, there's a growing number of Orthodox egalitarian synagogues, or what um, we call in Hebrew partnership prayer quorums, minyanim meshutafim, the first one being Shira Hadasha, where women read the Torah in front of a mixed congregation. Um, another drastic evolution is the emergence of egalitarian mosques, mainly in North America and Europe. Uh, again, to come back to the French example, um, our female Imam, Kahina Balul, has a project to open the Fatima Mosque in Paris, 
with an original approach since she plans with her male co-founder, Fakir Korshan, to equally divide ritual roles and have one week a woman lead prayers and the next a man for a mixed congregation, yet gender separated on different sides of the room, but without a physical partition. Now, these initiatives are, of course, still marginal. Many obstacles um, exist that are more political and sociological than religious. Um, but what we can see is that female imamship or female orthodox rabbinic functions can only emerge for now outside official or state controlled religious structures. Other women seek change without circumventing the male religious establishment. And this is my last point and I'll be finishing. Uh, what I call breaching into male religious spaces from within, again, other researchers gave um, different names to this process, where some Jewish and Muslim women prefer not to adopt radical positions. And in another way of negotiating gender borders, they want to break through male religious power structures by establishing new female roles that are accepted, sometimes after long legal struggles up to uh, <laughs> 20, 30 years, uh, institutionalized roles and clearly <laughs> delimited roles with Orthodox Judaism and mainstream Islam and roles that do not enter in competition with the authority of male rabbis and imams. So here I think that the function of murshidat, the Muslim religious guides, may exemplify perfectly this accommodation where they can deploy their Islamic expertise but gain official recognition and even very respect respected status. They have equivalent functions to imams. There's only one limit. They cannot lead any mixed prayers or female prayers, sorry, both, <laughs> nor aspire to imamship. In Algeria, Murtidat can write Friday sermons but cannot deliver them. Uh, another interesting example is a woman in Belgium who is um, considered a third class imam she has been appointed to a Bel Belgian mosque and has a paid um, position by the government. And she performs all functions of an imam except leading prayers. And she thinks this is the best way for her to uh, continue and uh, spread and preach um, as a woman murshidat. In a somewhat parallel manner, the role of female advisors in Jewish law, Yuatzat al could also exemplify this since they're progressively replacing the rabbis towards whom the women used to turn to and may show the um, most successful example of the feminization of religious authority tolerated by a majority of the male orthodox role. The female legal advocates, Toanot Rabaniot, have official recognition, paid positions, yet they feel that their roles are very limited and constricted. And I think here Tanya uh, has much more to say than I do. Uh, and might, this might be a, one of the examples that is a lesser success, if one says. So to finish, in the legal field of Islam, women have been able to become female ulamas, female, ish, female issuing, uh, female uh, women issuing fatwas, and women judges in Sharia courts and seem to be really truly changing status of women from within. There are of course still limitations. One example is Suad Saleh in um, Cairo in Al-Azhar University, who has been asking for years to become a muftia, a woman who could uh, issue fatwas and who is still denied this uh, title. So I'm gonna conclude. Uh, women who succeed in cracking the masculine world of conservative Islam and Orthodox Judaism often have para clerical positions, and they remain, con remain confined to fields of specifically feminine expertise or preach to only female audiences. Uh, this may give the illusion of empowering women, as uh, Jan Feldman has suggested also in her book, by reproducing religious male hierarchy. Um, other researchers who are, who are here have often discussed this um, very complex process between challenging male power and complying with it. And here, I think Muslim women may uh, show us the best example of how they can attain gender equality and have maybe become closest as kadyas or female ulamas to becoming gender equal. And this is why I think uh, we need further comparative studies to actually see how women in both religions, but we could uh, definitely um, add Christianity here, 
or using different strategies to attain um, gender equality. Thank you very much. Dr. Zoy is a senior lecturer in the Department of Middle Eastern and African History of Tel Aviv University. Her areas of, areas of specialization are the social and cultural history of modern Egypt, women and gender in Arab and Islamic societies, and Islamist movements in the Middle East with emphasis on the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. She has edited along with Dr. Tami Razi, a special issue of the Hebrew journal Hamizra Hadash on women and gender in the Middle East. Some of her most recent articles are feminization of, no, I'm sorry, um, the hybrid women of the Arab Spring Revolution, uh, Islamization of feminism, feminist, feminization of Islam, which was in the Journal of Levantine Studies, that's in English, and in Hebrew, the quiet revolution led by Saudi women from within in the Mizrahi Hadash uh, in 2018. And she will talk about Islamic feminism from within, Egyptian and Saudi women heading an evolutionary gender revolution. Dr. Soleil. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ruthie. Uh, <laughs> and thanks everybody, especially Ronit for inviting me to take part in this very interesting conference. Well, I start. Many scholars who deal with social and gender oriented issues in Arab and Islamic societies tend to adopt uh, the rigid binary categories of secular and religious. Religious Muslim women are usually identified with a conservative worldview, a traditional education, and a medium to low uh, socioeconomic status. The norms of honor and, and modesty governing these women are assumed to oblige them to confine themselves exclusively to the roles as wife and mothers and limit themselves in the public sphere. Secular women, according to this binary division, are portrayed as those who have liberated themselves from the shackles of, uh, of religion and tradition. They are assumed to be highly educated, liberal in their worldview, socially and politically engaged, and aspiring to build a career as component pro uh, professionals with the goal of becoming economically independent. They are ready to struggle for the rights as equals in both family and society. This binary approach stig stig um, stigmatizes those who raise their heads in the hijab and cover their faces with a niqab as women who willingly accept traditional norms uh, and behave accordingly. The history of women movements in the Middle East and North Africa were and still are totally different from that of women's movement in the West. While the Western suffragists led a secular struggle and saw religious, religion as anachronist and irrelevant to their feminist agenda, women who led social and gender oriented struggles from the end of the 19th century to the present were not secular in their essence. They neither issued challenges to the religion and tradition, nor tried to undermine them. Rather, they sought to use them to construct more egalitarian gender relations by means of alternate readings and creative inter interpretation of the early Islamic scriptures, relevant to the spirit of the times and changing circumstances, according to Ijtihad, which is the main principle of Islamic theological modernism. Moreover, these women view the outward appearance as a sign and symbol of the cultural authenticity they seek to extenuate. By their dedication to their faith and their social and feminist worldview, they unravel the binary approach imposed upon them by outsiders and construct a model that amalgamates a faith-motivated re religiosity and a liberal, pluralistic worldview. The religious knowledge enables them to distinguish between Quranic and Shari rulings on the one hand, and both customary patriarchal ones, which aim at preserving women's inferiority on the other. 
They, they absorb the fact that the absence of women from the religious sphere enables the patriarchal male religious establishment to blur the differences between the oath and the Sharia. This kind of hybridity characterizes most, if not almost all, of the Muslim female activists who lead gender struggles in the Middle East nowadays. In my presentation, I would like to concentrate on film, female activists of two different Middle Eastern countries. Egypt, which is a civil state, Daula Madania, and Saudi Arabia, which is a theocracy. In both countries, young women are leading a quiet gender revolution, which I term as an evolutionary revolution. It is certainly a Sisyphean one during which these brave women demonstrate both their assertiveness and determination to change the gender relations in their society, despite the high price they personally, as well as their families, have to pay. I would claim that the hybrid Islamic feminist identity is based on the feminization of Islam and the Islamization of feminism. The prototype of Islam they adopted is not a static one, but a dynamic one, which its rulings are deeply implanted in a historical context. Islam that enables fresh interpretation of the Holy Scriptures without contradicting or bypass bypassing previous ones, but contextualizing them and historicizing them. One of the prominent Egyptian women that can be characterized as a hybrid Islamic fe uh, feminist uh, is Tahani al-Jibali, appointed Egypt's first female judge in 2003. When asked why she chose to specialize on Sharia as part of her law studies in Cairo University, she answered, and I quote, once I started studying Sharia, I came to the conclusion that merciful God has never legislated for injustice, jaraim, crimes in Arabic. In all honesty, injustice has always been man-made. It serves worldly objectives and interests and sustains backward and unjust political and social situations." Unquote. Al-Jibali had a long history with the Egyptian Ministry of Justice. In 1998, she addressed with 24 female lawyers the Minister of Justice, demanding him to appoint them judges in various legal instances. The minister rejected their demands without any reasoned argument. Previous similar demands, however, were rejected by Minister of Justice due to, and I quote, the female emotional state of nature, which doesn't fit a rational profession such as law. Ajibali didn't give up and applied again to the Egyptian legal authorities, but this time she based her, her demand on a precedent from the early Islamic history. According to this historical episode, the second caliph Omar ibn al-Hattab, 7th century, nominated a female judge as the inspector of the market, Muhtasiba, the skills of that profession are equivalent to that of a judge nowadays. Al-Jibali's apply aroused the vibrant discourse among both jurists and religious personas, which resulted in a fatwa signed by Muhammad Tantawi, then the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, Ahmed Atay, then the Mufti of Egypt, and Mahmoud Zakazouk, then the Minister of Endowment in which these three senior religious personae asserted that Ajibali was absolutely right. Hello, Mariam, Zorina, what are you doing? I'm happy to be here. Can you please mute yourself? Okay, let's continue. Uh, ah. What do you yes. want to take the lead? Please, all the participants, if you can be me him, except for Mira, who's the speaker now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. In which these three senior religious personae asserted that Al Jibali was absolutely right in claiming that the Muslim Khalif did nominate 
two female judges as the inspector of the markets and that they both were authorized to judge those who and who entreated God's ruling. They ended the fatwa by declaring that if a woman was qualified enough to serve as a muhtasiba in the seventh century, women are certainly worthy of serving as judges in the 21st century. On March 14, 2007, the Egyptian Supreme Judicial, Judicial Council approved the appointment of 31 female judges following uh, the declaration of Sheikh Tantawi that there is nothing in the Quran that bans women from becoming judges. The number of female judges steadily grew when on August 2018, 16 more women were nominated judges. By doing that, these women broke the glass ceiling of the court of justice and turned it from a purely male sphere to a shared one of both male and female judges. Since then, female judges are engaged in reinterpreting Shari rulings as well as in new Quranic hermeneutics on women's and gender issues, among them violence against women, inheritance, female genital mutilation, and sexual harassment. 66 female judges out of 17,000 are certainly not satisfactory. We should aspire for a more balanced court, claimed Tahani al Jibali. To summarize the Egyptian female prototype, I would like to refer to another hybrid prominent young woman, Hiba Raouf Izzat, the editor of the women's column of the weekly opposition newspaper, Ashab, which is supported by the Muslim Brotherhood. Is that strongly opposes Egyptian secular feminists who regard religion as an obstacle to women's rights? According to her worldview, and I quote, being a Muslim doesn't mean that I accept the dominant discourse about women. We need a new interpretation of the Quran and Sunnah. We should benefit from the contribution of, of previous generation of Islamic sources. This doesn't necessarily mean that we have to stick to their interpretation of Islamic sources while we ignore the sociology of knowledge. By adopting this approach, the Islamic holy scriptures, Isa became a, actually an informal mujtahida, a female interpreter who uses her newspaper and her journalistic skills, as well as her religious knowledge to publish her views on gender issues based on a Hiktiadi interpretation of the Quran, Hadith, and Sunnah for a community of discourse, women and men alike. The second model of gender struggle takes place in Saudi Arabia, a theocracy in which Sharia is the formal law of the state. The hegemonic discourse on gender issues aims at blurring the lines between the customary law and Sharia law in order to Islamize the restrictions imposed upon women. These restrictions take place both in the private and in the public spheres. It should be noted that women activists in Saudi Arabia didn't act in any formal framework, neither in women's organizations, nor in movements with a fixed agenda, a leader or a leadership or financial sponsor. Rather, it was based on individual initiatives of bold women who took their faith in their own hands determined to improve their status both in the family and society and to obtain their civil rights as fully split citizens. One of these bold women is Wajia Hawaider, an outspoken journalist, poet, and women rights act, right activist who dared to drive a car on March 8, 2008, Women's International Day, demanding Prince Knight, then Minister of Interior, affairs to legalize women's driving. While driving, Hawaii recorded herself claiming that the problem of women's driving is neither a political issue, not a religious, a religious one, since there is nothing in the Quran that forbids it. A video of her driving was posted on YouTube. Hawaii adopted Aisha bint Abu Bakr, the beloved wife of Prophet Muhammad, as an Islamic authentic role model of a liberated woman who, like other women of her time, used to ride a camel. It never occurred to her asking permission from her husband, Prophet Muhammad, to do so. Isn't the car the modern version of the riding animals of the classical period of the Prophet? 
This is the question that both Hawaii and other bold Saudi women that followed her, like Manala Sharif, as well as moderate religious personae, posed to the royal family and the hegemonic conservative religious establishment. By adopting Aisha as the role model, instead of borrowing one from the Western feminist pantheon, they demonstrated bo uh, both the religious knowledge and their adherence to the religion. Through this strategy, they not only challenged the religious establishment, which aspired to preserve patriarchal gender norms in Saudi society, but also ridicule the chauvinistic explanation as to the sociopolitical as well as the professional restriction put upon Saudi women. Such an assertive declaration expresses the sharp and clear distinction how wider made between Sharia and Oath. On September 26, 2017, after two decades of an intensive and uncompromising struggle, a royal decree was published in which it was stated that Saudi women are allowed to drive in the country. It wasn't the only achievement that Saudi women can take credit for. Between the years 2009 to 2018, they broke some other glass ceilings when women were nominated Minister of Education and Labor. Moreover, it was the first time that women were appointed also as members of the Shura Council, which is an advisory council to the king. The Islamic argument that those advocated the nomination used was that Prophet Muhammad himself used to consult his wife in many crucial issues. For example, he consulted Um Salame before signing the Hudaybiyah agreement with the Qurayshi tribe in 628. And it is also well known that the Prophet used to consult his beloved wife Aisha in many important topics. In 2015, Saudi women were allowed for the first time to vote and to be elected as mayors in the municipal elections. 18 women were elected as mayors and three of them were elected as mayors of, of the towns Riyadh, Jeddah, and Mecca, which are considered political and economic urban centers. This time it was Dr. Suela Zain al Abedin, an expert in Islamic history and society at the Saudi National Human Rights Association, who stated that Saudi women have the right to participate in the election and that their, the right is deeply rooted in Islam. She told the London Arabic Daily Ashaq al and I quote, there was much social awareness during the early period of Islam, which showed an understanding of appointing Muslim women to important positions. One of the peaks of this process took place on July two, uh, 2018, when Abdallah Mutla, a member of the Council of Senior Religious Person Personae, applied to Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, asking him to nominate women who specialize on Sharia law in Saudi universities as muftia. Insurance of Islamic legal rulings will issue fatwas on female issues. Mutla claimed that, and I quote, these women are well versed in Islamic law, more familiar with women's issue and much more sensitive than we are, unquote. Although the Grand Mufti didn't respond to this appeal, this initiative is an achievement in itself. I would like to conclude with a poem of the Saudi poetess Hisa Ilal, who was the first female finalist in 2010 on Million Poets, a widely popular reality TV content watched by 75 million people all over the Middle East. Ilal proved that this contest can be a platform for women to be heard. It should be reminded that women's presence on stage is considered a Saudi, in Saudi Arabia a moral crime. Indeed, Hilal received death threats because of her participation in the contest and also because of her poems attacking polygamy as well as fatwas uh, issued by ultra conservative clerics. To these threats, she responded, and I quote, I criticize religious rigidity, tashadud, as I am a moderate Muslim, and a Muslima wasatiya. I criticize terrorism and killings in the name of Islam. I criticize those who want Arabs to close themselves off and to be hostile to others. 
if they, the religious persona, kill me, I will be a martyr for the sake of humanity, Shahida in Saniya. In spite of that, Risa Ilal stood on stage with a hijab covering her hair and then a cub on her face, reciting her critical poetry before a male audience. On the first round, it was a poem against polygamy, and I quote, when men get into your life, they shed light on you. But while living, they expel you with their tails. They can't resist the temptation while coming across young girls picking roses. They are overwhelmed by their youth and beauty. These riding horses find every now and then a new woman to marry, a woman that replaces her predecessor and totally erases her memory. They abuse young women, help their owner, and leave them helpless and hopeless. They force them to abandon their children. It tears their hearts to pieces. Their sorrow persistently grows. These are flowing from their eyes like a flowing river. Oh, you women collectors, how many of us have you humiliated, unquote. In this poem, Risa Ilal not only brings forth polygamy from the victim's point of view, but she also dehumanizes men who are engaged in polygamous marriages and nicknames them riding horses and women, women's collectors. Hilal allows herself to object polygamy because of her religious knowledge. She was aware of the ideal example of Prophet Muhammad, who stayed monogamous with his first wife, Hadija, for about 25 years until she died. However, polygamy was allowed in the Quran, but it was due to the special historical circumstances during which continuous wars took place in the Islamic territories that widowed many women. In order to save them from an economic and moral crisis, he encouraged men to marry two, three, and four women. But if you fear that you can, can't be equitable to them, what they do, then marry only one that is more likely to make you avoid bias, unquote. According to this interpretation, polygamy is not the preferred model of marriage, but the, op the optional one. To conclude, there is no doubt that the turning point in the lives of these bold women, both Egyptian and Saudi, took place when the Department of Islamic Studies opened the doors, doors for women. The religious knowledge they acquired was the ultimate means they used in order to struggle for the realization of the right in the patriarchal and traditional society. These courageous women are continuing to lead nowadays a gender revolution, or shall I be more precise, a gender jihad. It is by all means a unique prototype of a revolution, a quiet revolutionary one, but its achievements uh, so far are outstanding. Yet, it is still a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mira, just uh, if I may, just one question. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Can you just say very clearly the name of the Saudi poet? I know probably most of her poetry is in Arabic, but you know, maybe it'll be translated by somebody. Okay. You want me to, to say it, or to pronounce it, to write it on, on chat as you like, Ruthie? Uh, what? You want me to say the name or to, to write it down on the chat? Either or both. Okay, the, or her both. name is Risa Ilal, and I will write it down. Okay, thank you. And I wanted to say to all the people who are with us that you, if you have questions for any of our speakers, all you have to do is just click the chat on the bottom and you can write it in there. Uh, and then we'll we'll read them to the, to the speakers. Um, our next speaker is Naid. Ashkar Sharari. She is a social worker and a PhD student at Ben Gurion University in the Negev. She is examining religious identities yeah. among Muslim women in Israel in the context of family, society, and state. She has published two articles, one with her supervisor entitled The Colonial Religious, the Colonial Religious Institutional Contract. Muslim Women Activists in Israel, and the second in Arabic entitled The Birth of Palestinian Neswiya Islamiyah in Israel. And there's a, 
important reason why she says Neswia Islamia and not just Islamic feminists, I'm sure she'll explain it. So her topic is the challenges of Islamic feminism or um, Neswia Islamia among Muslim women in Israel. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's my honor to be here with all of you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you Ruth for uh, introducing me. So I will talk uh, about the challenge of al Naswiya al-Islamiyya, which literally translation is Islamic feminism among Muslim Palestinian women in Israel. My study examined the development of a new Neswi feminist discourse among Islamis, as among Islamic women in Israel and the challenge it poses to Muslim society. This discourse is promoted by the Women and Horizon organization, which defined it as Niswi Islami. The pioneering research conducted in this context is the first to reveal the religious Niswi school of thought, Al Naswiya Al Islamiya Al Ta'wiliya, which promulgate its idea among Muslim women in Israel. It explored the challenge inherent in a feminine and feminist religious awakening of this type and proposes methods of coping with them. Uh, I just want to, to mention and not explain very well that the interpretative Islamic feminism is one of its three, three streams of Islamic feminism. The first one is the formist Islamic feminism, which we can say that the women of the Islamic movement go behind that, and they did not uh, critique the religious classical um, uh, text from a patriarchal view. Uh, the, the second one is the interpretative Islamic Niswi. It's, the, it's my case study here, which I want to talk about. And the third stream is the refuse Islamic feminism, al Nasawiya al Islamiya al Rafida, uh, who claim that we cannot seek uh, um, equality for women from the Islam. So they refuse, they refuse to the Islam. Uh, al Nasawiya al Islamiya al Ta'wiliya is defined as a cross border movement that brings together all Muslim women who seek to redefine their identity in a more genuinely modern manner that befits their religion and culture. The women involved insist on their rights and refuse to sacrifice them for the benefit of Islamic patriarchy or for the settler colonial state. They have been disappointed by the classic interpretative patriarchal order and turned to the Quran formulating new Niswi interpretations to support them as they demand their right, the aim to be Muslim and Nesuyat and Nesuya. The movement has succeeded in activating the role of women in the religious domain and allowing them to propose inter reinterpretations for a number of verses, ayat, that specifically concern women. For example, the verse of Shahada, profession of faith, in the Quran, the Shahada verse told that one man of faith is equal to two women. And the Nesuya Islamiya al Ta'wiliya are attempting to change the classical patriarchal interpretation, as they claim, to a feminist one that asserts men and women are equal. It has also allowed them to present different points of view on matters such as kawama, men's authority over women, nushuz, the wife's subordinates, uh, subor wilaya, men guardianship, adel, justice, and darb, wife beating. The development of the, the Nisui discourse among Muslim women is dependent on region-wide political, social, religious, and economic conditions, and the post-colonial feminist dialogue recommends that gender concepts should be examined in relation to additional categories such, uh, such as ethnicity. Islamic feminism began to develop in the first 70 years of the 20th century, its geographic area has expanded to include North America, a number of Asian, African, Arab, and Europe countries, and individual women from various backgrounds and professions who decided to join the movement. Some of these women lived under colonial rule and witnessed national struggle, while others did not. Some are veiled, others are not. Some are Muslim from the heartland, others are from the diaspora. Some are Arab Muslim, some are non-Arab. The movement's leaders see this variety as symbolizing a break in the psychological barrier that forms an obstacle between activities from different backgrounds who address women's issues 
in light of the fact that secular feminists have often ha have often had difficulties dealing with Islamic activists. This uniqueness challenge challenged many researchers to expose the development of this paradigm in different political spaces. That it challenged me to examine its character and struggle among Muslim Palestinian women in Israel as an ethnic and national minority in the shadow of Israel hegemony. In Israel, Al Nasawiya Al Islamiya Al Ta'wiliya is taking shape under the dual control of the Israeli hegemony and patriarchal Muslim and Jewish religious leaders. Palestinian Muslim women in Israel live in different social and political structures than women in other Arab society or in the West. They face intersectional exclusion, one ethnic exclusion. They live under Israeli control and are defined as an ethnic minority and settler colonialism. They suffer from inequality when compared with the Jewish citizens. Two, gender exclusion. They suffer from a patriarchal social system in their own society and in the Israeli society. Three, religious minority and religious exclusion. For example, the Sharia court, the Sharia courts in Israel handle personal status law issues such as marriage and divorce for Muslim society. Its system has been in effect since Osman rule ended 1917 and it is controlled by Israeli laws. For example, concerning the polygamy, issues. Some women have tried to challenge these norms, but the neither the Sharia court judge nor the Israeli laws have helped them. My current study examines the challenge encountered by Al Nasawiya Al Islamiya Al Ta'wiliya, the strategies they employ in the shadow of the Israeli hegemony and the Islamic religious patriarchal leaders, and the path they follow in the development Nisui Islam discourse. Their critical Nisui interpretation of religious texts conflict with the patriarchal virgin that has reigned supreme for millennia. The Islamic religious activism came following a long period of collusion between the Islamic religious patriarchy and the Israeli establishment to control the Sharia law, entrapping women and depriving them of their civil rights. This means that Palestinian Muslim women in Israel have no thought to fight for change in Islamic law because they start to argue with complex, complex control the holy text gatekeepers and the Israeli hegemony, which present an additional challenge. Now I will talk about the methodology of the study. I used a qualitative paradigm and semi-structured interview with 10 male and female activists from a, of Women and Horizon organization. I asked them about their strategies in Nasuya Islamiya, what, what special challenge they face between Muslim society and Israel and how they promote the ideas of al nasawiya al-Islamiyya al-Ta'wiliyya. The organization is located in the north of Israel, funded in 2002 by a woman lower na named Saida Sa Bayatsi, and, a number, of, uh, and a, num a number of Muslim men and, wo and other Muslim women. In the organization logo, we see two women without the Islamic veil, as I wear it here, and in background, there is a blue sky. They are looking at each other in sympathy. The entire site is written in Arabic with minimal English, and, and it appears from its context that the organization works within the framework of Islamic law and is also identified with Nisuya Islamiyya, Islamic feminism, and wants to change the socio religious reality of Palestinian Muslim women in Israel. The study revealed that the Nisui Islami discourse of Women and Horizon addresses several structures of repression. One, state institutions such as Israeli Knesset Parliament are indirectly controlled the Sharia Accord eh, and prevent reforms in Sharia law to avoid setting a precedent that would also weaken their control of rabbinic courts. Fatin, a member of the organization, said the rabbis are afraid of the promoting of Muslim women as a judge in the Sharia accord. They are afraid that Jewish women will ask for similar things in the rabbinic court. Here we talk, here, her talk refers to the period before the appointment of the female judge in the Sharia accord in 2017. Muslim religious politicization is embodied in the Islamic movement, Sharia accord judge and press and civil society that entrench patriarchal control of personal and public spaces and limit female activists 
authority by according a traditional interpretation to religious texts. Women are thus cast to the margin of society amid accusation of national treason, secularization of Muslim society, and blasphemy. Alia, a member of the organization, said, religious people who belong to the Islamic movement and are active in local politics creating us and our activity once it was difficult for us to find someone who would rent a room for our organization. Furthermore, they're claiming that we are promoting a modern interpretation and Western and colonial conception. Amira says religious leaders from the Islamic movement prevent us from entering the mosque and carrying out activities. Uh, activities. They accused us of heresy. Uh, there is an alliance between state officials and the gatekeepers of the patriarchal and religious establishment, such as Islamic movement clerics, Sharia court judge, the Arab press, and the representative of civil society. Soha reported, we are told to, uh, to safeguard Islam and fight the Jews. Sometimes we try to keep quiet so that the Jews do not uh, er in, uh, intervene and take control. We want to promote measures such as laws, but cannot do so without a government, and, that the, and the government is the Jews one. Thus, we are letting the fox into the vineyard. It is difficult when one is, ta is trapped between two misfortunes, between Hamer and Anvil. Accordingly, Islamic feminist activists adopt various strategies for action and struggle. They seek to promote change through public and parliamentary activity in cooperation with male members of the organization. Furthermore, they uphold a critical interpretation uh, of Islamic religious texts, studying the ishtihad, that is learning the Nisui feminist interpretation of the Quran, recognizing that there are new outlooks that accord numerous rights to women who have accrued professional knowledge at religious institutions in Jordan and Palestinian West, uh, West Bank. Tagrid say our objectives are to change provocative, uh, provocative verses that are not to be interpre interpre interpreted literally, but are accompanied by extensive dialogue, such as the verse strike them. Pressured by accusation of treason and secularization and motivated by a desire to preserve their Muslim and Palestinian identities, these women reject the concept of Islamic feminism, claiming that it is a Western concept. Instead, they use the term Nasuya Islamiya with emphasis on Islamic religious identities. They construct a new, a new personal and gender identity that gives them previously unattainable recognition as, exper as experts in religious knowledge and thus effectively challenge the, estab the established patriarchal religious order. Muslim women's activists in, in the interpretative branch of al nasawiyya al islamiyya al-Ta'wiliyya represent the beginning of a feminist process that is critical of patriarchal religious view, proposing a change in the gender, legal, and political order that is taking shape under the influence of modern Islam. The Muslim women activists shift feminine discourse from passive and challenged acceptance of the, class, of the classic interpretation with all, uh, with all its patriarchal laws to an interpretive outlook that criticizes the classic, the classic interpretation from a feminist point of view in line with the principle of, principles of justice and human rights. Examination of this new Nisui branch of Muslim religious society consisted a, an innovative pioneering di direction in research on feminist Islamic discourse beyond Palestinian women in Israel that may well contribute a new feminist dialogue in national and Middle Eastern feminist liter uh, literature, extending it to additional context and location as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> We now have as a respondent, Dr. Sarab Abrabia Qaidar. She's a senior lecturer at the Department of Education at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Her studies focus on marginality, inequality, and agency from gender and racial perspectives among minority women in both private, family, and public spheres, higher education, and employment. She was chosen as the Sociologist of the Month for Current Sociology Journal 
in 2019, and the winner of Ot Katan from Women's Spirit Association for her academic and community activism. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ruth. Thank you all. Hi, all. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to this panel. I'm really glad to uh, have this opportunity to meet you all. Uh, I would like to highlight uh, several points and mostly raise questions that occur from the uh, four interesting lectures uh, we heard uh, today. First, the lectures offer a different socio-political context and structures that shape the Ijtihad agency that Muslim women employ. I will start with Mira's paper, uh, who offers the term evolutionary revolution for women who struggle to gain their rights from the Islamic text. She offers an outlook of Islam femini Islamic feminism through two different cases of Egypt and Saudi Arabia. While Egypt is a civil state, Saudi Arabia is a theocracy, Thus, they both offer different conditions for women's agency and revolution. In both cases, women succeeded in gaining senior religious roles, mainly as female judges. However, what would be more interesting to hear is what kind of other quiet revolutions took place before uh, 2008. What were, were there any other feminist initiatives that were not so bold and communicated, such as writing and publishing anonymously? We know that feminism in Egypt goes back to the uh, 19th and uh, early 20th century. The idea of liberating women according to authentic Islam and the Hadith goes back to Egypt's educated elite, such as Zainab al-Ghazali, Qasim Amin, and among others. However, in Saudi Arabia, there were no feminist NGOs or any formal public feminisms organization that we can think of who set the ground for a feminist change for women. So, um, what, were, where, what were the seeds that triggered the changes in Saudi Arabia, which for ages has had the most restricted rules on women? What is the role of the young political leadership that started to become closer to the uh, West? Have the political interests opened the door for some feminist changes? The two cases emphasize that religious knowledge cannot be the only means for this woman for the realization of their rights in their patriarchal and traditional society. Religious knowledge is not enough to fulfill women's rights and to reach leadership roles. Nahid's work shows us why it is almost impossible to conduct Islamic reform, such as in personal status law for Muslim women in Israel, even when they have obtained the required professional knowledge. Lisa offers another outlook from three cases of Jewish and Muslim women in Israel, France, and the United States, proposing three strategies for achieving their ishtihad. Her work drives us to explore three different socio-political contexts where Muslim and Jewish women occupy different statuses which affect their feminist ishtihad. In the US and France, Muslim women are a minority within a Western state, both that suffer from Islamophobia and hijab, hijabophobia, strengthened by formal laws such as the ban on the hijab in France and in numerous courts in the US. In Arab countries, Muslim women are part of a majority Muslim states where they suffer from religious and patriarchal discrimination. In Israel, Muslim women are part of the indigenous minority in a settler colonial state suffering from triple discrimination while the Jewish women in Israel are part of the majority ruling population suffering from patriarchal religious discrimination. Furthermore, unpacking the context of Arab Muslim states, the conditions of Muslim women in Tunis are different from those in Egypt or from any other country. The political context is meaningful to the analysis of their agency. Since agency is embedded in structure, we must unpack the various power structures that these women struggle with. To understand why the most drastic evolution, in Lisa's words, is the emergence of egalitarian mosques, mainly in North America and Europe, while in other Muslim countries this change is far from reaching, we must analyze the status of religion in Western countries, Muslim countries, and Israel as a Jewish state. Taking Israel as an example, Israel is a Jewish nation which is based on religious definition and sovereignty of Jews over non-Jews, state and religion are not separated. Thus, the religious political system have a major role in keeping both Muslim and Jewish women subordinated. Israel also maintains a dual control system in its religious laws. 
Sharia court system noted by others are not purely religious in nature, as it is controlled by the Israeli hegemony and functions under, under dualistic and possibly conflicting conditions. On the one hand, its laws are supervised and controlled by the Knesset, and on the other hand, Israeli state law has left the Sharia court in charge of marital matters, as it was since the day of the Ottoman rule, as Nahid shows us. Kariani noted that in Western countries or past, past colonial settler states, such as the United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, religion and state were kept separate and the national authorities tended toward official naturality in religious and marital matters. The legal systems of Australia and New Zealand transcend religion as well, according no, to no power whatsoever to the religious monocline. In these countries, marital laws are resolved in civil courts by civil judges. Can we conclude that Muslim women in these countries benefit from rights and more progressive marital laws as opposed to Jewish and Muslim women in Israel? However, they continue to suffer from Orientalist attempts to rescue them from the Quran and the hijab as noted by Deborah's paper. Examining the appointment of a female judge in all the countries mentioned as one of the most frequent achievements in public roles that women succeeded, the context play, plays a major role. In Israel, only in 2017, a Muslim female judge was appointed, but most experts read this appoint nomination as a political rather than a feminist act. The call of both religious and secular Arab feminist NGOs to nominate a female judge is not a new issue in Israel. However, for years, the Israeli government insisted not to do so, fearing from creating a president in the Jewish rabbinic case. Since the Sharia court have their own autonomy, the state does not interfere in their affairs. The Sharia court, as many critical scholars have pointed out, are used in the hand of the state as a means to oppress Palestinian women and to trap them in the hand of tribal and patriarchal gatekeepers. These complicated liars are, po are pointed, pointed out in Nahid's work where the triple colonial religious patriarchal contract trap Muslim feminist and limits a reform in personal status laws. Another challenge that feminist women face, especially if they are part of a minority group, is the burden to prove that their feminist agenda is not part of a Western agenda, giving the attack on Islam by orient Orientalist Europe Europeans or colonial administration, meaning they have to show that their feminism does not threaten the national agenda of their group or the country. The second point I would like to refer to is the various strategies and agencies referred to in the paper. Mira mentions a hybrid strategy where women Islamize feminism and feminize Islam, which is a strategy that goes through most of the papers presented today. It is a hybrid strategy where they, in her words, neither issue challenges to their religion and tradition nor try to undermine them. Rather, they sought to use them to construct more egalitarian gender relations by means of alternate reading and creative interpretations of the holy Islamic scriptures. Also in Lisa's paper, she presents different forms of, fix, of mixed versus separated feminine spaces, creating all female spaces, partnering with men or advancing, advancing from within. In order to understand the various agencies or strategies, we need also to understand what are the power structure they face that led them to employ each strategy. Why certain women choose one path over the other? Are there more privileged women than others that can afford themselves to pay a certain price that other women simply cannot? The massive writing on Islamic feminism offers various concepts that Muslim women are seeking to achieve. In today's presentations, we heard some of them, such as the terms equality, justice, adala, nasawiyya islamiyya, complementary ethical partnership. What is the right concept? Does the naming of the concept attest to the outlook of the scholar who offers it? Does veiling represent the most egalitarian stance of feminist Islam or is it unveiling? Does the separation between male and female prayer is the most progressive form of modern Islam or is it the mixed one? Does the basis of taqwa or the moral excellence makes the difference between less or more egalitarian Islam or does it relate to the self-understanding of women to the hijab and other Quranic verses? Some women seek to, lead to leadership roles as men, while others seek to feminine expertise, such as advisors on laws of purity, advocates in family laws without challenging male authority. Those different strategies point toward various streams within Islamic feminism and the existence of different Islamic feminisms, not only one fem Islamic feminism. We need 
to see this range of activism, not through Western white hierarchies of inferior versus superior, but as acts that stem from the intersectionality between gender politics, ethnicity, religion, and religious systems that form the different conditions for the various categories of Islamic feminisms. To sum up, Muslim women seek to be good Muslims and at the same time fulfill their rights without being disrespected by patriarchs, non-Muslims, or secular Muslims. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone, the, the, the panelists, for great lectures, which uh, at least I have learned a lot. Um, I would like to ask you uh, regarding the feminist hermeneutic strategies here, uh, that's suggested here. Um, during the 80s or the 90s, the Audre Lord, the phrase, the famous uh, sentence, um, the, the master's tools, uh, will never dismantle the master's house. However, according to your presentations, it seems that uh, those religious feminists actually gain, uh, gain the uh, access to, to make changes within, within the, their religious systems only by uh, achieving some, uh, as, um, uh, they, they, they could use the master's tools uh, uh, to, to fix uh, or to create or enhance uh, gender justice within their own traditions. So I wonder, what do you think about this uh, uh, this sentence of Audre Lord? And perhaps, if if it's correct that only uh, uh, by gaining some control over the master's tools, women can uh, uh, facilitate change. Perhaps religious feminism, uh, perhaps sorry, uh, secular feminism can learn something from uh, religious feminists. Yes, who would like to answer? I'm ready. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ronit, for your question. Um, you, as much as Egypt is concerned, at least, there was an experience of secular uh, feminism during the 20s of uh, the 20th century. Uh, Huda Shawawi, uh, one of the feminists leaders of the uh, uh, female uh, movement in Egypt tried to be secular. She put out a veil uh, and she, uh, she edited uh, a journal uh, in French, L'Egyptien, and uh, it made, made the impression that it was an elite movement and it couldn't include all the women that were really uh, able to take part in such a movement. We shouldn't forget that as much as Middle Eastern societies are concerned, we are dealing with patriarchal and traditional, almost religious societies. And there, if you want to succeed in, in gaining women's uh, right or improving women's status in, in the family and in society, you have to fight uh, your male enemies their own weapons. And that's why uh, using religion in order to reconstruct more egalitarian gender relationships are supposed to succeed more than secular movements that Allah, Allah is outside and the prophet is outside the story. Anybody else want to contribute? Yeah. I would just add that um, uh, the um, religious feminists, all the different kinds, um, have a problem because they're caught between um, feminists who say, well, you're not really feminist because you're limited by religion and look at all the um, things you try to do to, to get around it and, what you, and the little that you achieve on the one hand. And on the other hand, they are attacked by the, um, well, help me out, ladies. The, the male religious establishment who say, um, but in the, it, who say, that's not real Judaism, that's not real Islam, and you're going to teach us? Are you kidding? You know, you're not going to teach us. And when they're really being nasty, they'll say, okay, maybe that's okay for um, Americans, you know, those crazy Americans. Excuse me, Deborah, this is men, men personally, but you probably have heard it. Well, what do you want from Americans? They'll do anything. Um, 
On the other hand, I, I, I think, I must admit, although I'm not, must admit that there's a, um, we say in Hebrew, there's a little by little, these, these things are, are moving on from secular to, um, in, in Judaism, it's simpler because you have reform and conservative, da, 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 and eventually it gets to orthodox. And I think maybe the same thing is true in Islam, although it's not, um, uh, listen, um, uh, Amina was criticized all over the world for leading a prayer, right? And then uh, an, an Egyptian imam said, well, when was asked about it, I, I don't remember which one it was, probably, uh, um, you can help me out, Mira. But one of the, one of the uh, chief muftis of Egypt said, um, well, a woman can be, uh, lead the prayer, but it depends on the place, okay? What that means is she can do it in New York, but she can't do it in Cairo. But he didn't say she can't do it. So I think there is, um, I'm trying, uh, there's the negative and the positive. The negative are the limitations, of course, and the positive are you know, even little uh, contributions. Can, um, uh, I'm not ready to go so far as to say that secular women can learn. What I would say is if we didn't have so many problems, we'd be able to um, join in sisterhood, uh, you know? Can I add something? Uh, I, I oh. want to add something. Yeah, who was it? I, Nahid. Nahid, yeah. I want to thank Ronit for her question. I think that there is a really a secular and religious feminism make more gaps between others. But as I see here uh, within the Palestinian Women's Society in Israel, that in these gaps are growing something, growing something very interested. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the reinterpretative who, who choose to, uh, to critique the religious text from the patriarchal uh, point, they, they, they do more work to, to emphasize their identity. And, and the other one, uh, the Islamic movement, the women of the Islamic movement, uh, try hard to emphasize their identity more. So I think that something is very interesting grow between these gaps, between the secular or, and the feminist, or the, the, between the religious ones, the variety of religious ones. Mm -hmm. Rick, I agree. And I, I think it's also important to note that what we're really talking about are, are activism that flows out of women-centered ways of knowing, feminism being just one of those ways. Um, uh, in the U.S. in particular, you have Muslims and Jews and Christians who uh, identify as womanist, who identify as uh, feminist, who identify as musadista. So how one approaches, um, as a religious woman, how one approaches activism has a lot to do with context and culture. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Can I add something? Sure. Can I add something? Um, I would like to ask again, um, we heard about many strategies, hermeneutical uh, strategies, as well as political strategies. And I would like to ask you, what do you think were the most successful strategies and what strategies were failed? Um, I'm, I'm asking this because I'm very uh, interested in the question uh, of the kind of radicalism that uh, religious feminists should go through uh, perhaps in order to minimize the backlash from the religious patriarchy. So what, what do you think about that? Uh, can, I, can I answer, Lisa? Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, so this question and, and the one before too, uh, I think we have to also try to uh, think of what we can define as an achievement or a success is, for example, a... Um, Orthodox uh, American woman who uh, was ordained as a marat, as a religious uh, guide, um, who, for example, founds a synagogue. I'm thinking of Rabbi uh, Laila Kagedan, who has her own synagogue in Massachusetts, but is not recognized by any Orthodox establishment. Can you say she succeeded? Um, or is it, uh, you know, better, quote unquote, to be 
inside a, a religious structure and um, be a um, woman, for example, in a Jerusalem synagogue as an assistant to a rabbi, but be in the Orthodox establishment. So I think we have to think of, you know, what the woman feels is most fulfilling for her uh, goals or her faith. And the same thing for Muslim women is, is it more um, fulfilling for a woman to be a female imam like the woman in Paris who is also completely outside of um, religious uh, Muslim authorities? Or is it better to be like the imam I uh, spoke about in Belgium who works inside a mosque who is recognized by uh, Muslim authorities and just can't lead prayers for women? So I think it's interesting to think about those different contexts. Ladies, at this point is where I say we'll continue over lunch, but um, we can't. So we, but we will move on to the next really, really good panel. And I thank you all 